Hello, everyone. Welcome to the transportation Friday transportation seminar here at Portland State University. My name is Leming Wang. I'm co-hosting the seminar with Dr. Robert Bertini. Today, we are very glad to have uh, Dr. Rhonda Yang with us. Uh, Dr. Yang is a associate professor at uh, in the Department of Civil and Architecture Engineering at the University of Wyoming. Well, today she will talk about uh, the transportation and road weather. With that, I will just uh, let her take over. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to apologize up front. I'm getting over a cold. So, because um, I'm expecting you guys to talk, but as mentioned, I'm from the University of Wyoming. So, who's been to Laramie? Okay. We'll be talking about weather, and I, I live in a particular region where weather is, is dramatic and um, interesting. But I'm originally from the Northwest, so um, born in Astoria, just raised in Mount Hood, and until about 12 years ago, lived either in the Portland area or the Seattle area. So I understand weather here as well, so we'll try to do that. Um, I uh, like to talk about transportation engineering, or transportation as a profession, and you know, I tell my students, it's a fantastic profession because it allows you to be whatever you want to be. It's inherently multidisciplinary, right? So we could um, have engineers. Who's the engineers? Yeah, okay. We can have the planners. You know, we also deal with economists, you know, psychologists, you know, all, all types of human behavior type stuff. But what's interesting about the research area that I've found myself in with road weather is that I now get to be in the room with maybe the one profession who gets asked a little bit more than traffic engineering, and that's the uh, weather forecaster, right? So maybe I found the one person that could take more flax than I do. Um, but anyway, and then... We can maybe turn on your mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yes, my voice. Does that make it better? Okay. <laughs> I, like I said, I have, I'm having trouble with the feedback in my ears. But um, anyway, and I know when you go to talk to an audience, you're supposed to adjust your presentation to um, you know, sort of fit the setting that you're in. Or the other option you could do is just acknowledge your shortcomings. So I'm going to do the latter, which is I am inherently an engineer. And I will try to put it in the context of planning, but I am an engineer. And the other thing is that um, the research that I do and where I've been living for the last dozen years is rule, right? And so that makes me very sort of single mode, you know, um, automobile sort of centric. And I apologize because I know the audience that I'm in that that may resonate. But hopefully I'll try to fit in. Um, there are applications and, and where um, maybe raise some questions and we can start talking a little bit about how this can be broader than what I'm talking about. So I like to always start off thinking about big picture. So we'll start broad, talking about road weather and that interaction of transportation and weather, then kind of get into some details of a particular project that I just finished up, and then sort of end broad again. So how does weather impact transportation? Slows it down. Gets in our way, right? It keeps us from where we want to get to where we want to go, right? Can't get there as quickly or safely. So what can we do as engineers and planners? See, I'll put that in planners, but what can we do? Grin and bear it. Anything? Do we have? Well, I mean, we can, as a civil engineering standpoint, we can actually improve the road surfaces so that the drainage works, works the way drainage works better. Yeah, so we can try to mitigate the yeah, the impacts of it. And as engineers and as planners, we're always trying to solve problems, right? So thinking really broadly about the weather isn't just the weather, but there are things that we can do so we can try to operate things. So, um, so what weather do we, what information as um, engineers and planners um, <laughs> do we need if we want to make our system work better? We want to get there in one piece and we want to get there as sort of close to our normal time as possible. Design. So we want to have some information about the rain. And what's interesting about road weather is it's different than the weather that we get. Um, how do most people decide what they're going to wear today or not? <laughs> weather decisions, right? Do you, we mostly look on our phone now, I'm sure. 
and whatnot. But that's, that's what we call atmospheric weather. So is road weather different than atmospheric weather? Well, I certainly care about visibility versus when I'm walking outside, I really don't care. So yeah. Yeah, so sometimes we want different pieces of information that might um, not be there. But um, if, if you talk to meteorologists, when they're talking about weather, they're talking about atmospheric weather, and it's usually defined as things sort of 30 feet and above, right? So does that matter? Is there a difference between 30 feet and above and where I'm driving? Can anybody think of a weather situation that could be different at those two levels? Bob? Black ice. Black ice, yeah, so what's happening? So the road surface temperature as opposed to air temperature? Cooling. Sorry? Cooling. Cooling. Yeah, and how it's in. Um, and it can be, um, anybody ever been um, in a rainstorm where the rain actually never makes it? That's not here, but other parts of the <laughs> world where, you know, it's so warm and the, the rain doesn't. And then I'll show some pictures in Wyoming. What happens is it can be beautiful up there, beautiful crystal blue skies, but you can't see in front of you, and it's a, what's called a ground blizzard, and I'll show a little video of it. So, so thinking about the, the, the information we need as transportation um, professionals is different than what we need as sort of what they're providing on the weather. And so um, agencies often work with meteorologist services to say, can we take your models and then talk about what's happening from a transportation standpoint. And so this is what a lot of our um, maintenance crews at different DOTs use. So they want to know, they don't, they want to know very specifically is it snowing? How much snow are they going to have? Because they need to figure out how many snow plow passes they're going to have to do, what chemicals they may have to lie, um, lie down, and, and things like that. So it's just a little bit different. So here's some pictures. So it's, okay, I think we all live in a region that we understand that trans, um, transportation is greatly affected by weather. So these are just some of the ones. And you can have extreme weather events that require evacuation. Um, you know, and I think this is that Chicago storm where they all got stuck. I was going to find a great Atlanta picture. So, you know, it's been an interesting year for people who do weather research. But so let's, uh, the Wyoming Tourism Bureau always hates me when I show these kind of things. But let's talk about some weather. And I had to mute it because it's almost always done by truck drivers. And I wouldn't want to offend your sensibility for proper language. So what do you think? Comfortable? Okay. I can see the road surface. Pretty good, right? How fast would you want to drive? The speed limit is 75. Speed limit? 40. Yeah, 35. 40. 40. The interesting thing about the, the, the facilities I do research on is that they're, um, you know, mostly Interstate 80 is what we're going to be talking about today. And so who's on Interstate 80? Truckers. Lots of truckers. About 50 to 75 percent, depending on the time of year, of the traffic flow is truckers. Um, it's about 15,000 ADT, which is in Portland are like, there's nobody on the road. It's, you know, um, pretty low traffic volumes. But the thing about transcontinental is you always have to think about the person could be the guy from Atlanta, Atlanta moving to Seattle with his U-Haul who thinks winter's over because it's May. But, yeah, it can look like this in May. Right? And so, so people are making choices about what they would drive this in. So, yeah, okay, it doesn't look. To me, I think um, what I know about this type of snow is that um, it's not like snow here. It has very, very low moisture content. So I can take my trash out and my socks in the snow and my feet don't get wet, right? Very different than what you have here. I'm a skier, so I, <laughs> I care about the, the snow. And so um, friction is usually pretty good. And so w you get this big disparity between what people want to drive these. So, so. how about that one? How fast do you want to drive there? <laughs> yeah. I wanted to know, probably before I even left my house, I wanted to know, don't go. There's an absolutely no reason to be out on the road at that time. It's not, not even a reason for truck drivers to be out on that road. That road should be closed, right? But it's not. So one of the things about this type of research is that it might have looked fine where the, when the people left. This one happens really quick. This one's particularly colorful. If you know. <laughs> and then, 
Yeah. So I'll be honest, I had no idea before I moved to Wyoming that that happened. Right? So wind. So when I talked about the difference between atmospheric weather and road weather, wind is one of the biggest ones where there's differences, right? So when they talk about wind speed, they're talking about what's happening up there. They're not talking about what's happening in the forces on those trucks. And so one of the first projects I was asked to do by the Wyoming Department of Transportation was say, can you tell us how to not get the trucks to flip over in the wind? The truckers need better decision um, making capabilities and we need to know when to close the roads to high profile trucks or lightly loaded and so. so. Okay, so the, yeah, yet another good tourist picture of Wyoming, so. Anyway, so what should transportation engineers or planners, sh what, what should we be doing? Well, we should be using road weather to be making better decisions and better practices about maintenance, right? About traveler information. So that middle video I showed, people shouldn't have been out there, right? We should have been able to tell people that no trip, no job, no shopping trip, no doctor's appointment was really worth being out on that facility for. Um, and then the, the last one is better roadway operation. So that's most of what I'm going to focus on is that bottom one. And so I'm going to start by talking about how ITS fits into that picture and then kind of end with this sort of broad thing about where we're headed with connected vehicle technology and autonomous vehicles and how they're going to sort of fit within there. So probably to this audience, I don't have to define it, but you never know, I throw this stuff out there. So why do we use technology? What is ITS, right? There's a million definitions and certainly Dr. Pertini would spend lots of time talking to you about that. But anyway, so how can we use technology? And then specifically, what are we trying to get at with ITS? And its big focus is trying to get on that non-reoccurring. So we can start to see bad weather is about 15% of the, the delay that we get. Um, but I would say it's probably higher because traffic incidents are certainly related to weather and it's hard to sort of separate those out. So somewhere in that sort of 15 to 40% range are we dealing with um, delay, right? not to mention safety, right? Okay, so rural ITS is just a subfield of it, right? Um, you know, so it gets a little bit more at the safety than the delay, just because it's a rural in nature. Um, you know, a lot of the things that you'll read about it was also that they saw that there was money being made available, and so how could they address some of their issues through this sort of a new silo of money that was coming available? So, how does ITS improve safety on a, uh, on a rural highway? and specifically during winter weather events. How do we reduce crashes by using technology? Anything that we would define as ITS. So how is... Well, a vehicle is a vehicle. Um, they could, uh, your vehicle could be getting information of, uh, say, uh, weather conditions further down the road from another vehicle that is experiencing those in real time so that you can plan your trip accordingly deviate off that rule. Yeah. And so, so the key piece there is that idea of information. And that's where ITS always comes back to play. How can we use information so that people can make better decisions? Better decisions about how to travel, how whether to travel, what speeds is appropriate and whatnot. What about delay? The weather's the weather. I'll show you some numbers and, and towards the, the end of this that gets at this delay um, because what happens in, in weather events, we're delayed because usually somebody crashes, right? So it's linked back to safety. But some, and then they start um, closing the roads down, right? So there's tremendous benefits in terms of keeping the roads open for longer. Would you agree that using the sun be a way of using ITS to decrease delay? Yes. And that's what I'm going to talk about. That's, so that's kind of my, my area. So death by PowerPoint, I won't go into all this, but in, in general, you know, there are particular challenges that, that um, you know, relate to how we use ITS and during weather events. The, the technology, it's remote, it's hard to get communications, the weather is difficult um, on that equipment, so the equipment doesn't last very long. Um, you have long decision points between when people are actually going to leave their house and to encounter that weather. So. Um, you know, you just go on the other side of the Cascades and you get to that. You leave a town and you're out there 
for at least two hours before you can get to another decision point. And when weather moves quickly, you know, so, so not only are we talking about the weather at that moment, but we're trying to look forward and saying, what's the weather going to look like in the next two, five, you know, six hours, right? So what components? So if we're going to put together and have some sort of um, ITS system that's going to help us with this, we need to detect the weather, right? We need to get that information out to the public, whether it's vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications or, you know, just good old, you know, uh, highway advisory radio, which, you know, I'm not sure many people use, but... And then the part that I get excited about is the last part, the control system to operate it. So what are we going to do with all this information? So we have an input and we have an output, but what's the part that's in there? And I think that it makes for a fascinating field of transportation because there is no reference book that I'm going to pull off the shelf that says, I have this system, I'm going to imply this sort of logic to it. And so we get to be creative, and I think that um, that's exciting about engineering is trying to be creative. And so what can we do for that control strategy? Well, we could change the speed limits. We could certainly introduce different warning signs. They could be, you know, as active as you want them to be. We could um, automatically spray bridge decks with um, de-icing material. We could start closing the roads, closing them to particular vehicles, and we can certainly implement lots of sort of evacuation strategies with it. So the first part of it, we've got to get the information about the weather. So how do we know what the weather is? Well, we've got that weather forecaster. Well, I already said that his his... His profession is bash more than even my profession is, right? So I, I usually want to have some sort of supplemental. I may have a forecast, but then I want to know what's happening. So we do a lot of um, roadside sensors. So you can see this just happens to be the, the typical equipment that we're using um, in Wyoming on Interstate 80, but it's very common So if you start looking at it. So some sort of, you know, I, I pointed out the communication systems because we're talking about rule. This is a canopy system, so it ha uses line of sight. So this is what, when you don't have any kind of communication out there, um, not even uh, cell coverage, right? So you can use this to sort of get you back to cell coverage so you can start pushing data through your cell system, right? We love the cameras. Um, we want to have something about speed sensors. And then I put this one in here because sometimes we also need sort of supplemental roadway lighting. Um, or we have to use some sort of camera technology that will um, give us a, a picture of what's happening um, when uh, it's not daylight, right? So you can use kind of infrared or you can use night vision type cameras. Or sometimes we just throw a whole lot of lights in the middle of nowhere and people go, well, why is this section lighted? Well, it's a particularly section where we're susceptible to weather and so we want to get good pictures 24 hours a day from it. So. So there's lots of decisions that goes into the types of technology we use and decisions about those, so how we space them, um, you know, how confident we are, how do we do data quality, how long are they going to last, and then is it telling us the right picture, right? And so how do we get confidence in our data? Sometimes it's linking it back to the weather forecast. So if they're telling us this is what the weather's going to be and um, now we're observing this, then, you know, do those two pictures mesh? And if they don't, then maybe we need to do a little bit more fact-finding. Um, meteorologists ask also, you know, they do forecasts, but they also do now casts, which I think is kind of interesting. So it says, what's happening right at this moment? It can be an annoying to you as a, you know, walking down the street when the weatherman says it's raining, and you're like, of course it's raining. But when we're talking about remote locations like this, we actually want to know. Yeah, we, have, we feel good about our data because, you know, it's, we have multiple sources sort of fitting together. So how do we get the information out? Some of them pretty low-tech. I mean, how many people go to their AM when they're driving <laughs> on their bike? But they're still out there. I mean, you know, you have a, you have a broad road users out there. Um, but the more we can put the information sort of out in their face, the... the the better. Um, we can use uh, pre-trip sources, so this is where we're trying to get the information before. This is really large on um, making go or no-go decisions, so it's not worth it to make your trip. It's a discretionary trip. It's, you know, going to be bad weather. Um, the most popular thing is, is looking at those cameras. People like to see those. 511 Notify is, um, well, you guys are familiar with 511 systems, right? Travel information systems. So anywhere in the country, you dial that. 511 Notify is a um, text-based push system that says, I commute on this particular facility. Tell me, you know, what's happening. Tell me for major events when the roads close and things like that. Hard to think about in an urban setting. Why would the roads be closed? Um, but 
you know, when you live in these rural towns and you're going from, from place to place, the longest in the 12 years I've been in um, Laramie for the road to be closed is eight days. So for eight days it was closed and our shelves got empty in the grocery store and we just waited for the weather to come through. I promise I'll end with some nice pictures because it actually is a beautiful place to live. But, but, you know, so a lot of people are waiting. They're waiting for the roads to open. That Certainly the truck drivers are wanting that type of system. So, okay. So um, what about sort of modern technology? Right? So who uses uh, apps to make travel decisions? You guys are urban. Right? So does your app work in Laramie, Wyoming? Yeah. What's, what's the challenge? <laughs> Communication and, and, and yeah, just qu um, quantity, right? So when we start dealing with, with um, a lot of these um, apps, we can start to, to funnel through and get data quality just because we have a large volume of observations, right? And we can start to see that they, they fit together and tell the same picture. Well, what happens if you're talking about a road and I have a variable speed limit that has 300 cars a day? So what if like 10% of those people somehow wanted to use my, you know, app and wanted to, to tell me something about the road surface, you know? So I got 30 people spread out over 24 hours. And then how many of those are like, you know, rational, reasonable people? <laughs> Another percentage, right? So you start to get it. So, you know, yeah, yeah. Sensors along the side of the road in certain areas, I know they're implementing it in terms of like testing the new autonomous or connected vehicles that you're going to test. Yeah, so I'm going to get to that part because I think that if we could start pulling data off of cars and we take the people out of it, then we get a better data and more data. Sensory IT information that was helpful yeah. in rural areas, but again, they're not there and they're installing them. Yeah, so trying to fill in that picture. So, um, anyway, so um, may I promise, you know, for some of these driving decision things, but um, so. So we're always sort of watching what's happening kind of in the urban areas and saying, well, what pieces of it are going to sort of filter our way down to the, to the rural part? So I said the exciting part for me is the control strategy, right? So how do we, um, you know, this is where we get to create information. Nobody's done this before. Every corridor is a little bit different. I mean, there, there will eventually be some s more standard protocols coming from ITS, but it's still pretty wide open as people do this. Um, but you need control systems for it to be repeatable, right, and reliable, people to have confidence in it so they're actually doing it. And then a big question always comes up is, is there a human operator in the loop at all, right? So do we just let the computer make all the decisions or do we have some sort of traffic management center where they're saying, you're, you're right, we do need to close the road or we do need to lower the speeds. And, and you can have lots of sort of discussions about that. So ultimately, we're just trying to use information, get it to the people so they make better decisions, right? So about which route to go, whether to go at all. So here I'm going to talk um, about a project that I just wrapped up um, on variable speed limits, right? So this is... Uh, you know, implemented by the Wyoming Department of Transportation. We started about six years ago and just trying to make the roads. We had safety problems and we had lots of road closures, right? So they wanted, they had two different goals to do that. So um, in general, in the corridor, people drive too fast for conditions. So I showed you those videos and everybody in this room is going to make a different decision about what they think that speed should be, right? In particular, when you're dealing with truckers and non-truckers and people who, who are regulars, and people who didn't know that it snowed in June, that type of thing. So, um, you know, in general, when, when we post a speed limit, you are sort of required by law. And I know Oregon's a little bit different. They do speeds than speed limits. But, um, but, you know, you are required to make the appropriate decision about speed. So even though you are going below the speed limit, you can be cited for going too fast for conditions because you made a poor choice with it. But really the only thing that we can do with that and what the highway patrol says is we can't enforce that. The only way we can say that was too fast is you got in a crash. So you end up in a ditch, we pull you out, we give you a ticket and say you were driving too fast for conditions. Well, as a roadway operator, that doesn't help us. We don't want the people in the ditch because, you know, now we've created a safety problem and all that. So, so it, it, it's not useful. So if we can do variable speed limits and change the regulatory. 
So when you get into variable speed limits, you spend a lot of time thinking about speed behavior. And so this is where, as, as, as traffic prof or transportation professionals, you get to talk to and look at a lot of, like, psychology. So how do we make decisions about, about speed? And then um, there's a lot of um, belief about speed. Speeds, right? You know, we we drive and we feel strongly about it, um, and then when you're dealing with um, highway patrol type um, people, they feel quite differently about it. So, um, are lower speeds always safer? If I lower the speed limit, that will always be safer. Yeah, my students would say always is a trick word. <laughs> the answer must always be no <laughs> if you say always, right? But why? Low speeds are good, right? issues when there's a large deviation between Yeah, so, so what's bad about speed deviation? Uh, maybe it's hard to perceive how fast someone else is going if, if there's not consistency across the roadway. Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of our traffic flow theory sort of fundamentally comes back to um, fluid flow. And so you can start thinking about turbulence and friction. So all you have to do is think of a, a snowy storm event. And what happens when everybody starts passing each other on snowy roads? It's not good, right? You get spray from vehicles. When you're moving from one lane to the other, you're more likely to get into the slush that builds up behind, you know, between them. And so, in general, we want the safest speed is always uniform speed. If we could get everybody to travel exactly the same speed with these great headways, you know, that's safe, right? So why this perception that slower is safer? Crashes less energy. Yeah, see, because it's so, so linked to the severity. And so the highway patrol people, what are they reacting to? The fact that they s respond to all these crashes. And they say if they had been traveling 40 miles an hour instead of 70 miles an hour, this wouldn't have been severe. So you have these really strong perceptions about it. And so um, when we first put variable speed limit signs in, we were – Originally with the research project, we wanted to put them in, get a lot of data, not do anything with the signs for a winter, just start collecting weather data, and the highway patrol couldn't keep their hands off it. They said, oh, I've got those signs, and they just wanted to lower the speed limits to like 30 miles an hour instantaneously. Well, that doesn't happen because then you actually increase your speed deviation. So this idea about rational speeds and making good choices about what speeds to select. So. Um, we're, I'm going to focus, so here's your geography lesson for the day. Here's Wyoming, so beautiful Laramie down there in southeast. Um, to link it to something you may know, um, Denver's two hours to the south of Laramie. Over here, Salt Lake's about an hour to there, so big cities to try to get it in. Um, so these red corridors are where we have variable speed limits. Four of them are on Interstate 80, and this is this really low volume one that I'm not going to talk much about, but it's more a political decision than anything else. Um, but anyway, so um, of the 300 miles of Interstate 80 in Wyoming, 143 of them are operated under variable control now. So um, one of the first things we had to figure out signs. We used um, what are called scrolling film signs. So it's a big drum that has pre-printed. So we were very limited on the, the speed limits. But still, providing a range that said if the speed limit was going to be lower than 35, uh, we were going to close the roads. Um, we were told by the sign manufacturer, who I won't name and hopefully isn't watching, um, that I could put these in the North Pole and there was no weather I could throw at them that would um, make them not work. But they promptly froze and the drum didn't work. So now <laughs> we use the other. So anybody sort of MUTCD peaks? What's wrong with the one on the right? Uh, the fonts? The fonts and the color, right? Yeah. The, the, yeah, these ones are so the color. So regardless, um, these ones, you know, we had the reduced panel, and then um, all of them flash a beacon whenever it's below the 75 miles an hour. Um, but we had to get some uh, waivers because um, we were using the um, amber. And so you could use a full color matrix. We were having trouble with them. We have a couple of them. Um, but the snow, the way the snow gets on them, they have visibility problems, and these ones work a lot better. Okay, so here's the engineer in me. I get excited. We got graphs. What's happening? Okay, so um, we have trucks in blue, we have cars in red, and then we have a mixture in um, all vehicles, so the entire vehicle flow. And so frequency versus speed. 
So up here we have a speed distribution. And so if you just focus on the blue and the red, right, we get um, a bimodal distribution. Right. Why? We're 50% and in some cases 75% trucks, right? So we inherently have a bimodal distribution, right? So before anything happens, but we start thinking about this spread and if you look at the green, you know, it's, it's that mixture of it between. So we always have speed deviation in our facilities just because we have this tremendous mixture of vehicle types. But when we start to get into a, a, a winter event, we want to tighten that up because we don't want the, the um, trucks passing trucks and the cars passing trucks and the trucks passing cars and all that. We want to start keeping that speed harmonization. So this is, this is actually real data, so we worked, you know. <laughs> so you can see when we implemented the VSL, then we start to get it. So is this good? Yeah, I mean, it, it's better than up there, right? You know, but we're, we're still trying to define, well, what is good enough? What is tight enough? What is, you know, and then once the VSL um, went away in the storm event, you know, it goes back. And that's, that's just sort of the nature of driving on that interstate. On that slide, is it 65, actually, or is This one, um, this one, it was 60. Yeah. So we can look at where the, you know, the average or the 85th percentile. And we look at speed compliance and lots of different definitions of speed compliance. And, and there's about, there's about 1,000 pages of reports if you really want to get more into it. And so we've sort of set a target. We're going to keep implementing different control strategies and try to get that. But we're working on what is um, success. Okay, so when we first did it, I said I couldn't keep the, um, I couldn't keep the policy people from saying, look, you put out signs, we got to lower the speed limits. And so we operated under a manual protocol where they would just look at the weather and they'd say, this is what the speed limit. And actually, it was usually the highway patrol calling in saying, lower the speed limit to 40 miles an hour. Um, and so this would be a speed. We also, through this period, had what was called a seasonal speed limit. So instead of being a max 75, it, they lowered the speed limit to 65 during the winter. And we define winter as October 15th to April 15th. And even that sometimes isn't lenient enough. But winter is long, right? And so for six months out of the year, they would just lower the speed limit 10 miles per hour. And when I went and was talking with community groups and, and, and dealing with, you know, what is variable speed limits and stuff, I, if I was ever getting bashed by people, it was, they hated this seasonal speed limit. Why? Because 320 days out of the year, it's sunny. It's beautiful. So why are you making me drive 10 miles an hour slower? So, but anyway, this storm event happened to be during one of those. So we have um, cars in blue and trucks in red. And um, so we have this light blue, 65, which is saying this is the max speed limit. And then these are the posted speed limits. So did they do good? So we're dealing with, it looks like, you know, um, a, a couple, I was going to say a couple hour duration. I'm trying to get the time scale better, but... I would say here we have a problem, right? So people are traveling, so up at the beginning of the curve, right, is when they're um, saying, look, this is what they're, they're naturally going to drive, right? We got the cars going 75 and got the trucks going, you know, 70. Nobody's going 65 because they, yeah. And so something happens. So the road, you know, the, the weather deteriorates. I've lost the little mouse, right? So we should have imp started implementing the variable speed limit a much sooner. And then the other part is out here. And this is what we found throughout this whole winter, is when they lower the speed limit, boy, they never wanted to raise it. Right. It's like it's 45 has got to be better than, you know, or, or actually this, they just lowered it to 55. But that's got to be better than 65. And so they just kept it down. Well, um, this is just looking at average speeds, you know, a moving average of 15 minutes. Um, but when you, when you start to see poor speed compliance, you also see um, high um, standard deviation. Right. So the part of it is thinking about, well, how can we use control strategies so that we're getting more consistent about the speed limit? So this storm, if I see a storm like this again, this is the speed limit. So there's this consistency, so we get um, um, people who are comfortable with it. Oh, can you go back to that slide? I, I didn't see where it happened to the, the green line. Uh, what, and what is the... Like E, and w, B. Oh, east, so east, eastbound and westbound, you can't see it because they're actually on top of each other. So, yeah. 
just ignore that part. Um, yeah, because we can we can change the speed limits in in each direction differently, and so sometimes you see the lines sort of um, yeah look look a little bit differently. But this one, yeah. So it's 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 the average speed on both directions, and then you see that. So. So can we get better, faster response to fix that problem at the beginning? Can we be more consistent? And then can we also be more responsive, right, to fixing at the end? And so ultimately, what we're going to define as success is better speed compliance and um, reduced speed variation. So um, I love my models, but I'm not going to subject you too much to this. Um, we went through a lot of uh, process, so developing this control strategy. And we, um, we, the data that we have, uh, the input data, so this is just one of those corridors, so Elk Mountain, so Laramie would be over here on this side, and a town of Rollins, which you never would have heard of, has a state prison, it's over here. Um, so this is a 52-mile corridor where we have 14 road weather stations and uh, 22 speed sensors. So um, it's, it's remote, and it's um, the, the corridor on I-80 that closes the most, right? And so that's why we started. This is where we first implemented technology. So we developed an algorithm. We had two branches to it, one based just on speed, so looking at what was happening with vehicle speeds on 15-minute basis, and the other dealing with the input from the weather. So why two? Can I recommend pick something up that your which doesn't? Yeah, they're actually sort of telling you different pictures, and, and particularly at the beginning and end of storm events, right? They can tell you different things. Um, speed perspective is also a, a little bit of a problem when you're dealing with low volume, because you can get lots and lots of periods where you just don't have that many observations. And so sometimes it's going to be telling you um, the speed should be pretty high, but it's just because you have you observe 10 people and they're all truckers and they're all late or something, you know. So, so these two things, and actually we did spend a lot of time on simulation and found that the balanced um, uh, perspective. And also we have trouble with technology, right? And so um, with, even with all the redundancy that we have, this allowed us, if, if um, sensors were down, that we still had another branch to sort of fall back on. So. Um, anyway, so we got lots of data from our speed sensors. We had to, um, we updated every 15 minutes. We had to put a traffic count logic in there to make sure that we weren't overweighting things. We would use longer observation periods the, the um, more the volume got reduced, right? And then completely independent of weather variables. On the weather side, so my first um, experience with variable speed limits prior to moving to Wyoming was um, I-90 over Snoqualmie Pass. Anybody travel that? Um, it actually has a fairly straightforward logic. It just says, um, you know, if the snow level is this, you know, it's a, it's a matrix. You can look at it on a piece of paper. And I knew that Wyoming weather would be more complex, but I had still hoped that through the modeling process we would kind of get like five different kinds of storm events. Like this is a windstorm and this is a blowing snowstorm. And what I found was, I don't know what normal is. Like it, the data, you know, it's so complex. So we ended up using more of a, like a neural network approach, saying I'm not really going to understand the fundamentals of it, but I'm going to parse the data out until it starts making sense to it. And um, that's what we came up with. And ultimately this ended up being good because we've also found that even though I couldn't figure out what normal was five years ago, I really don't know what normal is now. And so a regression tree approach is very adaptable. It can keep learning. And so as weather keeps changing, which can be controversial in Wyoming, but as weather keeps changing, then we keep, you know, our system keeps getting small, um, smarter and smarter. So anyway, we had to put some logic in there about, um, so this is a simulation where this is what they, the red is what they actually set the speed limit for a particular storm. This is a storm that lasted um, four or five days, so quite a long storm. Right? And then this purple, which is a little bit hard, but you can see it in there, is what my original algorithm said the, the speed limit should be. Well, nobody's going to want the speed limit to change that much, right? So, so the fun thing about algorithms is you run simulations and you test them and you say, okay, I've got to put logic in there that I don't want a lot of five mile per hour speed limit changes, right? People don't really notice, don't really care. It's just sort of annoying to them. So let's, you know, kind of put logic in there that kind of dampens it, right? So that, and you also have to think about the fact that people are taking about 45 minutes to travel through this corridor and enforcement issues. And so you put logic that doesn't let the speed limit change too frequently. Maybe you can come up with how we should 
the speed limit or is it suddenly just going from about 75 to yeah, it'll do the big drop because we'll get weather that will come in quite quickly. So we don't have logic that prohibits the magnitude from a maximum standpoint. It's more from a minimum standpoint. So, and that's just the nature of the weather and how it, how it comes. So we can run lots of simulation events. And the thing about transportation is you run lots of simulation because you can't just play with the public and test things out. So anyway, um, more... Data. What we found through sort of running our protocol versus what manual protocol is, we get more, we still want more frequent speed limit changes, but they're reasonable now. And they sort of match, they follow the speed limit better. Looks a little bit like a medical chart, but anyway. And then through running through these and, and doing lots of studies, this is where I'm sort of waving my hand and not showing you a lot of the math behind it. Um, we found that if we went to control strategy versus manual that we got better speed compliance and better um, uh, standard deviation, right? But we did change the speed limits more frequently. For that. Okay. So then the last part of it was sort of evaluating. Does this work? We cared if it worked, if it, we got good speed compliance, good speed observations. And then ultimately, what were those two goals we wanted to do? Reduce crashes and reduce road closures. So did it work? We ran through lots and lots of models. I want to tell you, we had to um, look at sort of magnitude of speed reductions, just to sort of the way we had to kind of normalize the data. And so I won't look too much at that. Anyway, what we found is, yes, when we went to our um, system, that we, we did better with the VSL than without, is what we're talking about here. Not necessarily different control strategies, but saying, are people reacting to the, to the variable speeds? And they were, but guess what? They didn't really react very well if you lowered the speed limit too much. Well, that's obvious, right? But sometimes in, a, in the nature of transportation where you're dealing with engineers and policy and politicians and highway patrol and everybody, you have to just put the data out there and say, look, you're hurting yourself when you're lowering the speed limits too much. I know that it's like this gut reaction that you want to do it, but you're actually causing more crashes when you do that. So, so sometimes you do data things just to do that. So we did lots of safety analysis. So we've now had the VSL in our first corridor for three years uh, under implementation. And then they kind of came on in different um, levels. So somewhere between 18 months and three years. And so we were able to start doing our preliminary safety. So if you're a safety person, you know, you can't just look at one year, right? So we ran lots and lots of different types of crash rates. Lots of things. We know, right? So this is typical of what's happening in, in these corridors. And so the red line is telling you how many crashes per year on a particular corridor happen during the summer. Remember the six months of summer, which is generous. And then the six months of winter, right? So this is that April 15th to October 15th. So we have pretty good, you know, sort of baseline. These are crashes that happen during good weather. And then the winter is all over the place. So we know that whatever we do to evaluate safety has to have weather variables in it, right? Because you can have a good winter and a, and a harsh winter. I mean, everybody is talking about it this year because of how hard the, the winter has been across the country. We couldn't talk about safety here versus the other. So, so we had to put um, weather in there. I can spend a lot of time. I, I talked a little bit about atmospheric versus roadway, right? Because we installed the road weather information systems with the variable speed limit, we didn't have early weather, so it led us to needing to use forecast weather. So we had a bunch of winter maintenance forecast data. Tested lots of models. Once again, I'd, I'd love to talk more about models, but we're talking big pictures here. Anyway, ran models, ran all, luckily the, the coefficient for variable speed limit, so before and after is a binary variable, was always significant, and the coefficient was stable regardless of, you know, each of these models that we sort of estimated and tested for. Um, and big picture is we found um, on a weekly basis, it reduced about um, eight-tenths of a crash normalized over this um, length. So sort of building back up using crash history that we have on Interstate 80, we were able to say that we have about an annual safety benefit. So benefit due to reduced crashes of about $2.8 million per year. Where is that money? Where would it have been coming from otherwise? Yeah, well, who is saving? Who is saving? Society is saving money. So um, 
So when you talk about um, economics, right, and, and particularly the economics of transportation, it is usually, it falls into that sort of social benefit cost or cost effectiveness realm. So the idea that um, it's built up on numbers and these crash costs come, they're federal highway numbers that are sort of run through the state of Wyoming um, and uh, calibrated for their conditions. And so it's money that's not being spent on uh, medical bills, not being spent on car repairs, and um, being earned by the fact that these people are out there still working on their jobs and being productive in society. So it's not that anybody's paying money. But that's the nature of transportation. Almost everything that we do falls into this sort of um, social benefit. There's no changing of hands. So it's very different than, I teach economics in my school too, and so I could go on and on about that, <laughs> that part. But, um, but it's just a sort of benefit to society, right? Okay. We did a similar model for crash, um, crash reduction. I thought I put it. So um, uh, for road closures. Okay, so this is a graph of the road closures. And so before I moved to Wyoming, I didn't really think that interstates closed, maybe occasionally, but they close a lot, right? And so these are different years. There just happened to be break on that April 15th just because of the way we define summer and winter. And you can see... Um, in the winter, you know, in some cases, we had the road closed 100 times in a single season. Now, this is defined as one of those four corridors closing. Sometimes all four closed at the same time, right? So, getting not, not to put you on the spot, so what's the benefit, a social benefit, of keeping the road open? Where does that money come from? Increased uh, delivery of goods, making sure that people have the supplies they need. Yeah, so, so that idea of delay. And when you're in an urban setting, delay really is dominated by the fact that if I get to work five minutes earlier, what am I going to do? I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to look at Facebook five more minutes. I'm going to, I'm going to work five more minutes. And I'm going to be a productive member of society and I'm going to generate income for the machine, right? Yeah, well, okay. So, um, but that's where, we, when we talk about travel time benefits, it's a, and, and there's a lot of research about maybe chunks of time. Five minutes does very little, but a half hour does a lot or something. But when we're talking about an interstate corridor, it is dominated by trucking. And so the numbers that I'm going to show you are only based on trucking. So, and they're only based on actually an extremely conservative definition of tr trucking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The thing though is, is that when the road closes, on average, it closes for eight hours, and so they they are they're just parked, and and we start closing the road back through Nebraska because we run out of places to park trucks. They just don't have any place to go, and so we just keep, we do this rolling closure just to, you know, for, there's only a certain number of ramps that these guys can be at or truck stops and whatnot. Um, but we're going to use a definition that says there's a, a value to time for the fact that the truck driver is not moving, right, so he's paid an hourly wage, and the fact that that um, truck is not in the fleet, and so another truck has to be used, right. Um, we are not going to put in there the value of the goods that's on there. Right? So he could lose his um, shipping load because it's perishable. Um, or the fact that he um, could be, he or she, that's the gender, but uh, could be carrying TVs that don't make it to Walmart, and then I can't buy my TV, and so I'm not spending money from the great capitalist machine. So, um, you know, so, so there's actually, I'm using an extremely, I guess the point is, an extremely conservative number for it. And still, $54 million. So if we can keep these roads open, and there's this tremendous pressure to keep roads open. So um, these are just, like I said, sort of early numbers. So how, okay, okay, Qu really quickly because I've run out of time. How does this all change in the future? Connected vehicles. So you guys are savvy. I don't have to define co connected vehicles, right? We're going to get more data. Can I get weather data for the car? I can, right? I can. I can get certainly temperature data. I can get a uh, road surface from your um, ABS systems. I can get the wiper settings. I can get that the lights are on. I can get all kinds of stuff. And actually, I'm working with um, NCARS, National Center for Atmospheric Research, and they have what's called a vehicle data translator that says, let me take your onboard com um, information and change it into mobile weather. So we'll be starting this winter 
um, instrumenting vehicles on these VSL corridors to start seeing how connected vehicle data is going to fit in with our control strategy. Does it allow us to use less road, roadside sensors? No roadside sensors? Is the, you know, are they going to tell the same picture? Are they going to tell us the picture in between the sensors? And so, um, so I'm excited for next winter. I'm excited for summer too. So, so how, how about autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars? How does that fit? 20 years from now? 20 years from now. Well, first of all, how well do autonomous vehicles work in the weather? What adjustments are they making? I heard that they're updating them, and that I was going to ask you that um, they're going to have the first ones available on the market this summer. But I guess Nevada already did a flight one in like this 2020. Yeah, they're starting to be out there, but they're right now they're not. It's my understanding, and I guess I'll go to Detroit to the World Congress and see some more. But it's my understanding they don't, in general, like the Google car. They just well, they're in Southern California. You know. But they, they're not really operating it in Wyoming weather, right? So they're not really making adjustments. The, the logic that's going on within autonomous vehicles is not adapting to the weather. Um, and certainly we need to do that. If we're going to make them commercially available and sell them in some place other than Arizona, you know, we're going to have to start doing that. But the other thing is, is what happens with autonomous vehicles if we want speed harmonization? Because every algorithm for every car, every car performs differently. And so there has to be some sort of overriding part to that. driving behaviors and stuff like that, so every, every car will operate at the same speed, the same kind of They manner. will, yeah. So autonomous vehicles takes away the driver behavior part, but you still have different driver performance, right? And so you still have different vehicles in the fleet. And so there needs to be some way of saying, yes, you're an autonomous vehicle and you make great choices and you're better than a human driver, but at the same time you're still operating in this system. Or, or maybe the fact that it, you know, they're sprayed by snow, they don't care because they're not people and they don't react like we do. So, anyway, so I said, will it make all this weather-based stuff obsolete? I don't think so. Um, I think they have levels. The, the level three one allows you to um, succeed, control, get obtain control again, and they'll send out warnings for transition time frames. But yeah. level four is supposed to be completely obsolete. So I would say, say that level um, three definitely would be applicable to weather conditions, and they would be also implementing a forecast. Yeah. Yes. So it's interesting. I mean, you know, uh, you know how all these new pieces of information, because ITS is just about information, and all these new things are just how it all is going to fit. And so I always have to end. So this, this is right outside of Laramie, because we do have beautiful weather. So now they'll let me. The tourist bureau won't. So I, a lot of stuff, and I talk fast and wave over a lot of stuff, but hopefully it was kind of interesting to see all that. So I, I have ear problems, so I'm really, I, I guess I saw you. Evaluation of drivers' response to the VSL system because he said that they didn't like the, uh, the seasonal speed limit. Did they like this better? Yeah. So, so two things: we can see how the drivers like it in a secondary way by how well they comply to it, right? And so we see the higher compliance. But um, you know, the thing about a state with only 500,000 people in it, I actually, you know, can. Um, everybody knows everybody else. But anyway, we, we spend a lot of time talking to different groups and, and doing articles and stuff. And people like this. They, and, and so much that they were very quickly to implement the next three corridors, and then there's, I think, four more planned. So, so it has good support. And then these numbers are just showing that now there's the, the, the meat behind it, that they're making the right decision. And I totally lost track, so I apologize. But <laughs> you develop a relationship with the trucking industry as you're working through these plans? Are they offering input? Or? Yeah, they're offering input. And their huge motivation is they, they, um, there's so much cost to them when the roads are closed. So they are behind anything that is, is l allowing the roads to stay open. So they're very favorable. And, and we said, and I, through other research, I saw, showed the trucks blowing over in the wind. And we, we have a good relationship with the trucking association from that because they're, they're, that research is still going on. And then you, and then you, okay. So with the regents for class, could you speak? Oh, Todd Borkowitz. No. So for the, uh, uh, with the technology that is actually out right now, that um, uh, the automatic braking with the automobiles, that if something comes into the road and you don't see it, your car will stop for it, or sensors will pick it up. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering, um, utilizing that technology, um, 
uh, whether it's a semi-autonomous vehicle or a fully autonomous vehicle, um, to basically control speed so you don't have to close down a highway, but like at a certain situation where maybe the US, uh, the Wyoming DOT kind of says, okay, we're going to reduce everything to 45 miles an hour in these conditions, where basically the, the infrastructure actually tells the vehicles and forces them to slow down to 45 miles an hour? Yeah, I think that's what we're hoping to go, yeah. Is, is where it's, you know, it's back to that whole idea of automated highway system and just sort of like, look, we've got things going on and, you know, free will is good and all that kind of stuff, but, like, let's just platoon and get through this, you know. And, and frankly, like the trucks, 97% of them are not coming from Wyoming. They're not desperate for Wyoming. They would love to just be platooned and asleep. They should be on the train, but they're not. But, um, <laughs> you know, but, yeah, so, so you can create that uniform. I actually lived in Denver for a while, and I've been through this corridor in Wyoming that you're describing. Uh -huh. um, most of us are from an urban area. I lived in the Bay for a while, so the ITS that we know occurs at like mile, maybe half mile increments, These the signage. Uh -huh. But the corridor you're talking about is 100 miles, and then it's a pretty big distance, right? Yeah. So how do you allocate your resources when you get the funding for this type of technology to distribute it across such a huge span? Yeah, so we get away with spacing. So, like, if you look at, like, the ATMS system, like, going into Seattle, right? And was, those are, like, quarter miles, right? I mean, yeah. Um, so we're spaced at about seven, av on average seven. So a low of about four and a high of maybe about 10 miles per hour. Um, so we get away with a lot um, less technology. And in general, of the four quarters, the, they all had sort of varying levels of technology already there and communication and stuff. But they're about a million dollars in, in capital costs in terms of technology we install. So even with four of them, four million dollars. So um, it's, it's just inherently cheaper to, to build out there. I mean, so. Hi, my name is Alicia Holloway. And I had a quick question because I've been looking into autonomous vehicles and I was hoping that you might be able to tell us where we can get more information. But they were talking about closed headway platooning versus free agent. And I was wondering if you could provide clarification. It seemed like potentially one is more like connect and the other one was, they were saying it was made for, the free agent was made for mixed traffic and the other one, the closed headway platooning um, connected vehicle was made for certain types of traffic. It's kind of minor things. I was wondering if you could yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a, an expert in this. Um, it's my understanding is, well, I mean, even on simple cars, not autonomous cars, where you have the um, stop and go tra uh, cruise control type thing, it's just saying I'm, I'm letting the vehicle be autonomous by making decisions, but my, the only decision I'm really saying is how close it's going to be to that. So you fix the headway and you just say, it doesn't necessarily mean that the vehicle that you're following is an autonomous car, it just says I'm fixing the headway versus a free agent where you um, are letting the, the speed behavior sort of algorithm take control. And so it will allow you a lot more lane changes and um, passing behavior, right? So, yeah, I mean, the, but I mean, the, from what I've read, that's, that, those are the, the differences. And so it's, it's just a matter of like, you know, when we're on that freeway and it's stop and go, we can change lanes, but you know, nothing. Even though my kids keep pointing out, Mom, that lane is faster. It's not, right? And, and so it's just this idea that you're operating on a protocol in terms of what input it says. Is this, I'm just going to follow that person. Like, I'm going to get through this traffic jam versus l trying to let the vehicle sort of try to find a path and weave its way through. Thanks, Gregory Kirkland. Um, the, um, have you looked at the uh, ITS being employed on uh, 217 here in Oregon? And if you have the similarities that maybe you guys have done in Wyoming. I saw, maybe somebody in this room, I saw a presentation in Phoenix last year from somebody from PSU talking about, okay, <laughs> I was like, somebody. Um, I drive to 17 a lot because I, I tend to stay over in, in that part of the area. It was my understanding it's really rain-based. Um, yeah, so, but, but roads, surface condition, like it had a road surface condition. And then you're talking about, um, so what happens when you have congestion in with weather? That, that really is a question. So no, he can't answer it. Um, the, the headways will be bigger? 
Yeah, so you, so you have this sort of headway thing. And ultimately, what it gets down to is your weather condition changes what your fundamental diagram looks like, right? Your speed, um, flow density. The, the characteristics of those under certain weather conditions change, right? And so your algorithm essentially says, these are the conditions, here's, because you're, you're trying to, you're ultimately on something like 217 trying to push people through. And so you're trying to find that um, maximum flow number. But it's changing because that fundamental diagram is changing, reacting to the headways usually to it. And so um, it's a confounding factor that I don't have to deal with that much. But <laughs> um, I-70 in Colorado <laughs> we'll say, is one that's like that, where you're up in the mountains, you have severe weather, um, and then just massive volume. And so I've, we're doing some work on that. We're out of time. Okay. Uh, thanks, Professor Yao. <laughs>